Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, Sunday, May 17th. We're continuing our our series on the Ten Commandments. A and today I'd like to uh, to talk about the Ten Commandments in their in their most immediate context, in the context that we find them in sacred scripture. I mean, yesterday we put them in their broadest possible context, right? The, the context of God's eternal wisdom. And we saw how these commandments are expressions of uh, the natural law, you know, the, the way we were created as, you know, human beings in the image and likeness of God means that we, we embrace the reality of the universe. We embrace the wisdom uh, with which God created us um, by our choices, um, by the way we live our lives. But what's really important to understand is that God wants from us, he asks from us more than just a, a series of right decisions. Um, because what we see in scripture is that from the very beginning, he called man into a loving, permanent, face-to-face -face relationship with him. A relationship that sacred scripture calls a covenant a covenant. Uh, and he, God made a, a covenant with Adam and Eve, you know, even after they sinned. Uh, he made a covenant with Noah, with Abraham. And, you know, and each, each version of that covenant is going deeper and deeper in uh, revealing himself to his people and in um, asking them for their worship. And, and now we are at Moses, Right, um, the the story of the people of Israel that we that we read in the book of Exodus. You know, it, it's interesting if you've ever seen that that old movie with uh, Charlton Heston, The Ten Commandments, uh, which is a great movie. You should watch it. I mean, it's Hollywood, but it's great. Um, you know that the title of the movie is The Ten Commandments, but in fact, like we only get to the Ten Commandments way at the end of the movie, right? And the most of it is just the story of Moses and his people and how God liberated them from slavery in Egypt um, with all these great signs and wonders. And so, you know, the movie tells the whole story and we, we, sh we should understand the whole story too uh, because the, um, the Ten Commandments is, in a certain sense, the crowning glory of God's work in leading his people out of slavery. Um, and, you know, even the details of how he does that are, are interesting for our purposes. Um, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, before he became Pope Benedict XVI, he had this wonderful book. I've talked about it before. He, he, he wrote a book called The Spirit of the Liturgy. And um, just in, in starting to talk about how we as Catholics worship God, he, he actually starts at Exodus. He starts at... at um, Moses and his, his leading his people out of slavery in Egypt. And he looks very specifically at um, how Moses frames this request to Pharaoh. Like, you know, read Exodus chapter 5 and then Exodus chapter 10. It's really interesting uh, because what, what Moses says first is not, let my people go and leave you forever. He says, no, let, God says, let my people go a three days journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifice to me. That was the original request. And, um, you know, after, after all the plagues, Pharaoh eventually says yes, but then he says, okay, but only the men. And Moses says, well, no, no, so, you know, sorry, we got to bring our women and children too. That we don't, it's the whole people that has to sacrifice and worship God. And then he says, okay, fine, but your flocks and your herds stay here. Moses says, no, no, that, that, that's not going to work because, um, you know, we, we, we don't know what from the flocks and the herds God is going to ask us to sacrifice to him. So we got, we got to take everything. Um, and, you know, of course, then, then Pharaoh says, nope, sorry. And God has to be even firmer with him. Um, and, of course, we, we read that and the obvious interpretation that comes to our minds is, okay, this is, Moses is just being tricky. Right. This is the this is a pretext for getting everyone away and everything away. Uh, it's a clever trick. 
Um, but Cardinal Ratzinger says, now, wait a minute. You know, no, there, there, there's something in that request that actually expresses God's deepest purpose in freeing his people from slavery in the first place. Yeah, the, the, the reason he frees them from Egypt is that so that they, so that they can worship him. And, and, and worship him not just with a few ceremonies. He, he wants them out of slavery so that his people's entire way of life can be shaped by that relationship with him. He wants them out of slavery in order to enter a, a covenantal relationship with them. And like, there's an important lesson there for today. Um, you know, we speak about slavery in Egypt and the, the, like the worst part of that slavery, the worst part of any tyranny is when the tyrant tries to become God, tries to take the place of God and even tells people, you know, you shall not worship. Um, you know, in, um, in communist Poland, when, um, the, the, the government was trying to break the hold of the Catholic faith on the people. Um, one of the things they did was like, okay, everybody's going to work on Sunday. All the factories are going to be open on Sunday. You want a job, you are working on Sunday. Um, and this was one of the, the first demands of the, the free and independent labor unions. Was No, like, you got to give us Sunday off. Um, you, we, we have a duty to worship God, which means we have a right to worship God. Um, and so, um, and you know, and even there's that, that, there's that little kind of insidious variation on that tyranny is when, you know, you know, perhaps the, uh, the, 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 the ruling power will say, okay, well, yeah, sure, go say whatever prayers you want, but don't let it affect the way you act in public. Um, then you still got to play by my rules and not, not, not think of God. And, you know, what we as a Christian people have got to say is, no, sorry, the flocks and herds have got to come with us. We're going to worship God with everything we have. Um, we are going to live in the freedom that God wants for us. And for the people of Israel, and for us as well, the Ten Commandments are the shape of this newfound freedom. They're the shape of the covenant. Uh, because what you know what happens in, in any covenant it's a it's an agreement there are mutual promises not just in the sense of a, a business contract but more in the sense of like um, a marriage you're entering into a new way of life uh, and this is actually this is how God describes his relationship with his people you know throughout the Bible the Old Testament and the new um, it's a, as intimate and as powerful and as life-shaping as, as a marriage between a husband and wife, and even more so. And so, you know, when, when we think of the Ten Commandments, we, we should be thinking of them as more than just distinctive thou shalt nots, because every, every command and every act of obedience on our part is a, is a faithfulness to vows. You know, it's like how a husband and wife would wear a, a ring on their finger to, as, a, as a reminder of their, you know, their whole pattern of life. Uh, the Ten Commandments are like that. They are, they are signs of the covenant that we have with God and signs that we say yes to by our daily actions. They are signs of our relationship with him and ultimately they're they are signs of our liberation from slavery to sin. And we'll start uh, talking about some of the details very soon. God bless you guys. I'll see you tomorrow.